This is Celebration Church, but it's more than just a building or a church. We have a calling to be a place where people can find a relationship with God instead of religion. A place where freedom is found and acceptance given, and every person can discover their purpose and experience the kind of fulfillment only God can give. Together we will raise, lead, and empower a generation to change the world. Here, Jesus is famous, and all the glory goes to God. This is celebration. This is our family. Welcome home. in all things I've seen a glimpse of your heart a billion years still I'll be singing how can I praise you enough how can I praise you stars in glory your love is like the wildest ocean oh nothing else compares creation calls all to the savior we are alive for your praise in earth and sky
Now we want to pick up uh, the, the account in 2 Samuel, the sixth chapter. Now David was told, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went up to bring the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. Now here's the context. Uh, the ark of the covenant that Moses had built. You know, that, uh, you know, all these incredible things were happening around the ark of the covenant and they bring it. They're, David sets up his city, Jerusalem. It's called the city of David. But the ark still hasn't brought, been brought into the city because uh, they have a hard time moving it because if you didn't move it just right, <laughs> bad things would happen. So they were just recently trying to move it, and it looked like it was going to fall over. And some guy reaches over to try to hold it. Instantly, he drops dead, you know, because it's like grabbing 220 volts. You know what I'm saying? So David freaks. Ah! And he says, we can't, we can't move this thing. So they leave it at this guy's place, his property, uh, house of Obed-Edom is the guy's name. Well, because the ark is on his property, the guy starts getting blessed crazily. Everything's going good for him. He, everything's going well. He's being blessed. So the guys come to him and say, man, everything this guy has is being blessed. Everything's going so great because of the ark of God. So David went to go get it. <laughs> his, his idea is, man, he's getting blessed like crazy. I want to get in on this, which is kind of a drag for poor Odom Edom because uh, it's being taken away. But in a way, it's a great uh, picture of someone who really wants to experience God. He's not just happy hearing about somebody else experiencing God. He wants to experience God. Good lesson for us. So he goes to bring up the ark, and they're working it out, and they're bringing it very carefully. And at verse 13, when those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, just six steps, they're going slowly. <laughs> then he, he sacrificed a bull and a fatted calf. Anyway, wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and sounds of trumpets. So this is a major party. They are finally bringing it. This is like a big deal for the Jewish nation. As they come into the city of David, the city of Jerusalem, they're bringing in the ark. The trumpets are blowing. People are shouting, celebrating. And David just starts doing a jig. And he is dancing like crazy in front of this ark and probably looked a little crazy while he was doing it. All right? How do you know that? Well, the very next verse. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, which is now his wife, uh, watched from a window. So if, if you go back to the story of, King, of, of David killing Goliath, it's really rather funny. We talked about last week about his confidence. But if you read the story closely, he's going around and he's listening about the reward that's going to happen for whoever kills Goliath. So he's motivated also by the reward. In fact, three times he asked people. He heard what was going to happen. He said, so what's going to happen? And then they asked him. So he said, now tell me again. What, what's really going to happen? And, and the reward was whoever gets it is going to be, get a whole bunch of money. His whole family is going to be freed from taxes. And he gets to marry the hot babe. All right, Michael. So he gets over this over and over again. So finally he kills Goliath. And of course he winds up with, this, with the lady. So anyway, Michael, the daughter of Saul, was watching from the window, and when she saw David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. Why? He's making a fool of himself. And she is embarrassed because, you know, <laughs> one of the joys of being a husband and or a father is the joy of embarrassing your spouse and your children, <laughs> you know, and doing things <laughs> that freak them out. <laughs> Freak them out, you know. Every man knows what I'm talking about. So anyway, so David is, he's just having a good time and he is boogieing and he is dancing and twirling and you know that phrase, dance like nobody is watching? That's what David was doing. He's dancing like nobody, and I don't know what kind of dance he's doing, but he's shaking it up, man, and he is, enough that she is looking, oh my goodness gracious. Look at him, what in the world is he doing? Well, then they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it and 
David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. And after he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. And he gave everybody a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites. That's a lot of dates and raisins. Both men and women and all the people went to their homes happy with bread, dates, and raisins. Well, when David returned home to bless his household, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, well, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would do. So, she, you know, she's got quite the attitude, which has been known some wives can do that from time to time. <laughs> well, anyway, David says to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father. <laughs> or anyone from his household. There's issues in play here. When he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And he was. He was the rock star. Everybody loved David. And then Michael, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death, which means he was not spending any time with her, if you get my meaning here, which David had four other wives, so it's kind of easy to do when you got four more in the wings, you know, just <laughs> dump the one, pay attention to the other one, so. So anyway, something about, about this. So today we're talking about finding freedom. Last week we talked about knowing God today, finding freedom. If there's anybody who found freedom in this event, it is David. When you can absolutely dance like a crazy person and you don't care who's watching, you have got a degree of freedom that most people do not have. Freedom. Jesus said in John 8, verse 32, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen. And he goes on to say, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If there is one thing that should mark the life of a person who has come to Christ and given his life to Christ, it is freedom. Freedom. Freedom from what? Well, freedom from the past, mostly. Second Corinthians, Paul writes about this. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. The past is taken care of, is put away. We are now free. Free from what? Free from sins, free from failure, free from guilt and condemnation, free from, as David had here, what other people think. I'm amazed at how many people are just tied up with that, so worried about what other people think of them. I gave up on that a long time ago. But uh, it's amazing how many people think, yeah, praise the Lord. <laughs> but they, you know, people, they're, from, oh, ooh, well, what so-and-so thing. Man, what a horrible way to live. I would not want to live that way. We're constantly walking around in fear of what somebody else thinks about me, somebody else, but, you know. Now, there's a certain degree of responsibility as your pastor not to make a complete fool of myself in the city. <laughs> but generally, I just don't care. <laughs> you know, I don't care. I just don't care. It's freedom. It's free to be set free from your past, from your failures, all your mistakes. That's the freedom that we're supposed to walk in Christ. And if there's one thing that you'll notice about people, people outside the faith community, and if you look into them, and, you know, we were in O'Hare Airport yesterday, and, uh, you know, it's like as people walk by, it's like the day of the living dead. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, seriously, people walk around, just, and we're just watching all these people, and the waitress that's serving us look like she had just been raised from the dead. You know, she just, just and people, they just, they just got weights around their neck. Why don't they smile? Why don't they have any joy? Because all the bitterness and the anger and the failures and life, life is rough. Life will beat the snot out of you. I guarantee to you. All right? And if, and if you're not careful, you let these weights wrap around your neck and suck the life out of you. People walking around all bummed out and stuff like that. If there's one thing that should describe a believer in Christ, however, it is freedom. Because old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. We now walk free of our past. Our past no longer defines us. It's not supposed to anyway. It's amazing how many people, when you talk to them, though, boy, if right away they rehearse everything about their past, everything that happened to them, who did them wrong and who ripped them off and people that won't talk to them. I ain't talking to them anymore. It's amazing what you can hear people just in five minutes of conversation with them. 
from the get-go. I mean, they have just got this stuff wrapped around their necks, bitter, angry. I remember one time I met a lady for the first time in the forest. She walked in, and first time was there, and I shook her hand, and immediately she just started vomiting all over me. I thought, that person who did this terrible thing to us, he was awful. She was describing it was horrible. I said, oh my goodness. I said, when did this happen? She said, 20 years ago. And I thought, dee, 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 dee. Okay, here's a lady who needs some freedom. Somebody say amen. amen. All things are passed away, man. Let go of the past. Don't let that stuff hang on you, drag you down, pulling on you, slowly sucking the life out of you. Good night. What a horrible way to live. We're supposed to walk in freedom. Jesus came to set us free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Even when things go wrong, we can still walk in freedom. Even when your physical freedom is taken away, you still have freedom. It's an amazing thing. We read an example in the book of Acts, which is the history of the early church. We pick it up in Acts, the 16th chapter, 16th verse. Now once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. So that's her thing. She had this spirit in her. that could do, and She predicted the future, and she had all this power and stuff, you know, had a little tarot reading card thing on the corner, you know, whatever. And she earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. People paid big money to go sit with this lady. These guys loved it because she was a slave. Everything she made, they made, right? So this is the power she has. So anyway, Paul and Silas and all these guys are preaching. So he says, she followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Now, what she's saying is true, but she's not doing nicely. She's following them everywhere. These men are servants of the Most High God. Well, she kept this up for many days, which shows great patience. <laughs> and somebody follows me. This man's a pastor of Celebration Church. I'm calling the cops and getting a restraining order, you know, a couple of hours. I'm not putting up with this. These are for days she's doing it. These men are servants of the Most High. It is irritating the snot out of Paul. And he's getting madder <laughs> and madder. Somebody shut this chick off of her. What is her problem? And you could tell it was a spirit. So she kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit that was in her, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. Now, a couple of things about this. Oftentimes when people are acting bad, we want to get mad at the people. Somebody say amen, right? But what you understand is oftentimes there's something in them that's causing them. You mean they're all demon-possessed? Not necessarily. I'm just saying this is the people, they have reasons for the way they act. And it's hard, you know? Uh, again, we were in O'Hare. And, uh, and no, we were in Detroit first. And we were at this restaurant and this place is packed and there's like two servers the whole time. And it's taking forever to get served. And the food is horrible. And I want to, you know, strangle the waitress. And, uh, but there were more spiritual people around me at the time saying, you know, she's having a really hard day. And she came over and said, you know, we see you're having a really hard day. Just, just take your time. And I thought, yeah, what they said. You know, right. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't being as kind as I should be. I wanted to throttle her, but then I thought, yeah, they're right. Look at her. She's having a really hard time. See, sometimes we got to sometimes separate people's behavior from the people. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You know, sometimes people act really badly and mean and nasty, and you just want to punch them, say nasty things about them. But you get, if we don't separate people from their sins, we'll miss the point. That's what God does. He looks at us at our worst, at our biggest disaster. No matter how nasty and icky and ugly we are, he's able to separate us and love us. He's able to separate that from us. And that we need to learn that as well. So Paul immediately, this woman is irritating the snot out of him, but immediately he could tell he could separate her from what was driving her. And more, in this case, he knew that it was a spirit in her. So he says to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left her. Well, when her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone because her buzz was gone, you know, I don't know how long this took before they figured out, you know, she was like normal again. Well, now they're ticked. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. 
They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice, which was not true. But that's what they were accusing them of. And of course, this is the Roman Empire that they're dealing in. Well, the crowd got all jacked up. And they joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. Well, number one, it's a bad day when you get arrested. Number two, it's a bad day when they beat you with rods. It's a really bad day when you do it naked. I mean, that's, that's just it's like, this is, this is embarrassing. It's an awful day for these guys. Well, after they'd been severely flogged, not bad enough to be flogged, but severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And a jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. And when he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in, feet in stocks. So look at their day. They're just going around helping people. They're being nice to people. They see this lady. She's all jacked up. You can tell it's not her. He tells the spirit to let her alone. She's set free. And for their efforts, they get arrested. They get humiliated. They get the snot beaten out of them. They get thrown into prison. And then their feet and everything's all tied in stocks. This is a bad day. A horrible day. Now, a lot of people with a day like that would say, Oh, God, where are you? <laughs> Why did you let these things happen to me? But that's not what Paul and Silas does. See, do he says in verse 25, about midnight, which I would be sleeping after a day like that, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. What is it with these guys? These people are jacked up. They're crazy. They should be cursing. They should be angry and bitter. But yet they're singing. What is that about? Because they were free, you see. On the outside, they had been robbed of their freedom, of their liberties, humiliated, beaten, thrown in prison, couldn't barely move inside this inner cell, feet and hands all secured. But they were still as free as they could be. And they're singing songs to God. And everybody's listening to these nut jobs. Suddenly, there was a, such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. <sighs> At once. All the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought that the prisoners had escaped. You have to understand, this prisoner wasn't part of a police union, okay? Back in those days, these guys, if somebody got away, they would kill you, and they would kill you in the most miserable way you could possibly be killed. They would slowly tear you to pieces. The minute he saw these doors open and thought they had left, he thought, man, I'm going to kill myself. Better to go by with your own hand than what these people would do to me. So he grabs his sword. He's ready to take himself out. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. And the jailer called for lights. That's the other thing. It's pitch black. Called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Saul and Silas. Silas, because he obviously fallen asleep with some of these guys sing songs and being happy, and how is that even possible? And he runs in, he falls before them, he brings them out and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I went in on this deal. Here's a guy who was blown away by the freedom that these guys had exhibited. Wow. The question, of course, is are you walking in freedom? Here's the sad thing. A lot of times people come to Christ, they know God, which is our first step. But it's like they never get to a place of freedom. There's millions of Christians who are still absolutely bound up by their faults, their failures, their pasts, their mistakes, their injuries and their hurts, and they just can't see some of them, they're their addictions, bad behaviors. They just don't seem to get free. Are they people of faith? Yeah, but they're still walking around, not completely free. It's kind of like we read in the Gospel of John when Jesus raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. Remember, he comes to Lazarus and uh, he's been dead like three or four days, so he's mostly dead. I mean, he's totally dead, completely dead. And 
uh, he says, roll away the stone. And they says, you don't want to do that, man. It's been, you know, this, it, it reeks in there. He says, roll away the stone. So they roll away the stone. And when Jesus had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And I'm sure everybody went, <laughs> what's going to happen now? And sure enough, the dead man came out, which would give me a heart attack, and then they put me in there. But, uh, but the dead man came out, and it says his hands and his feet were still wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. So that's what they do to people. When they would bury them, they'd go through these rituals, and they, they'd wrap them all up and stuff around their face and their head and stuff like that. Well, this guy comes hopping out. He looks like a mummy. You know, he's... <laughs> Seriously, I'd have, I'd have passed out. I see some mummy coming out of a hole in the wall. I'm out of here. You know, I'm dying. So this guy comes out like this and... Ah! And Jesus says, go let him go. Take off the grave clothes and let him go. But see, that's a lot of Christians. It's like they come alive in faith, but they're still all wrapped up. Why don't you walk free? Well, Pastor, I made a mistake. I, I did something I shouldn't do. I, I married an idiot I shouldn't have married. I, you know, I divorced somebody. I did awful things. My in-laws hate me, and I hate them back, and I got... <laughs> I got issues that I'm, I'm mad all the time and, you know, I can't help it. I'm German. I get mad at everything, you know. And, you know, and it's, it is what it is, and it's, you know, and I can't stop drinking and I can't stop cussing and I can't stop. And I just, I got issues. They're still all bound up. Are they in faith? Yes. What's the problem? They're still wrapped up. And Jesus said, unwrap him. Let him go. Now, that's the call of the church. How do we all get to a place of freedom? We need to unwrap people. <laughs> they have issues. <laughs> now, one of the most powerful ways you can do that is by getting involved in our small groups. What we were just talking about in the announcements there, getting involved in small groups. And that's where we've made the adjustment that we have in our schedule, just going to first Wednesdays and stuff. You know, it wasn't just to be mean to people and upset people who like things the way they were, although that always happens. It's a, we're doing it for a purpose, and the purpose is to free up people's time so they get involved in these small groups. Why? Because the only way you can truly get free is for somebody to help you, somebody to unwrap you. I mean, if you feel wrapped up this morning, you don't need to feel bad about it. I mean, don't get comfortable with it, but me just talking from here isn't enough. Someone needs to come and unwrap you and set you free. And the only way they can do that is by getting to know you.